Don Chafin was born in Marrowbone Creek in Kermit, West Virginia on June 26, 1887. It was originally in Logan County, but the area became part of Mingo County in 1895. He was born into a family of 11 children, and then he was educated at Marshall College, which is now known as Marshall University. Don Chapin had many careers ranging from store clerk to teacher to sheriff. He was also related to Devil Ant Hatfield's wife, Levice Chapin Hatfield. He married his wife, Mary Mounts, in 1905, and during his life they had seven children together. Don Chapin easily made his way into a political elite of Logan County. He was the county assessor by age 21, and in 1912, at 25 years old, he became the county sheriff for one term. In Logan County, individuals could not serve consecutively in the same office, so he served as county clerk rather than lose his grip on Logan. He succeeded in placing his father-in-law in the post of sheriff again. Don Chafin became sheriff in 1920 with a tight hold on the political structure of Logan County. The man was a force to be reckoned with when it came to the mine wars, for sure. During the hiatus between him being sheriff, he was in the military for a short time, but he was excused because he had a, a bone of some sort taken out of his leg or something like that. I can't find any real records to back this up, but what I do know is that he was only in the military for about a year or less. I think it was 1917 to 1918. I didn't look into that extensively. Either way, during the mine wars, Don Chafin was a pivotal figure in attempting to halt the movements of the United Mine Workers of America and to organize miners in Logan County. He was a formidable opponent against Union organizers and developed a reputation for his brutal tactics. Don was despised by Unionists. When he walked into the headquarters of the YMWA District 17 in 1919, he was shot and wounded. I read he had been shot another time, but I can't find records of the second time. But one time is enough. He lived, though. Don was funded by non-union coal operators in the area. When the Logan County Coal Operators Association decided to form its own police force, Don and his deputies were hired by the operators to keep the peace and to keep out the union. Don was allegedly paid approximately $2,275 a month to work for them. Don and his force of deputies formed a major defending force during the infamous Battle of Blair Mountain that took place August 1921. Armed Union coal miners from Kanawha, Fayette, Boone, McDowell, and other counties participated in a pitched battle along the heights and gaps of Blair Mountain. The number of miners that participated estimated between 7 and 20,000. The exact number remains uncertain. But Don's force numbered perhaps 2,000 people, including a few locally owned planes that dropped homemade bombs on the miners during the battle. The Battle of Blair Mountain ended after President Warren G. Harding deployed 2,500 federal troops in a squadron of bombers to the area. It is known that Don took bribes and treated, treated the miners viciously. Mother Jones, who was a powerful Union activist at the time, dubbed him the Tsar of West Virginia because of how he treated people, comparing it to Russia. Following the Battle of Blair Mountain, Don Chafin would serve time in the federal penitentiary in Atlanta, Georgia. His incarceration was not due to his actions in the mine wars, though it should have been, but for a violation of prohibition statues. In 1929, it's said that he left Logan area and moved to Huntington, but on census I found him still in Logan in the 1940s. At some point, he moved to Huntington, though, where on the census it has him listed for work as coal, coal estate real estate. And this is a 1950s census, and it shows him living at the hotel that he lived in for a while before he moved to the penthouse of another hotel. Here in Huntington, he lived out his years as a millionaire. 
Don died in Huntington August 9th, 1954, at the age of 67 after a surgery and a heart attack or two. It is said that in his later years, he became a philanthropist, giving money freely to many charities. I'm, I don't know this to be true, but that's what I read. Don Chafin's memory lives on in the area to this day. He remains one of the most prominent yet controversial figures in the history of Logan County and beyond. Everybody, it's Leo. I'm in the video too. Uh, <laughs> uh, I am back out on the prowl today. Uh, had about a week hiatus there. You know how it is. You want to go do your videos, but life has other plans. No, you need to work on the truck. No, you need to work on the Can Am. No, you need to finish the deck and stain it. So. <laughs> But anyhow, like I said, we are back out on the prowl today. Uh, Heather's working on a story. Heather's working on Don's story at home. And I'm out today getting the last three sites for Don's story. Um, this story's actually, it's been in the pipe for a couple months, actually. Uh, his sites were spread out. They were, you know, pretty far apart. So we did part of it. Uh, when we did our little Huntington trip, our camping trip, we did the grave where his grave is and stuff. And I am after the last three today. Uh, I stopped here. This is Gaston Caperton Drive, just off a of corridor G, US 119, Southern West Virginia. The regional jail is right up the hill here. I figured this would be an appropriate spot uh, considering, you know, the subject matter uh, of today's story. You know, the regional jail's right there. But, uh, you know, it's just a pretty little spot. Uh, I just thought I'd stop here for just a second. Check this view out over here. Thought I'd pick, you know, just a pretty spot somewhere along the way. And, I mean, you know, it's southern West Virginia. It's springtime. Uh, I think it's May 5th, I believe, something like that. But, I mean, just, you know, spectacular. This is nothing particular here, you know, and it's just look how beautiful. I mean, other than a cup, it's, you know, one cup but and one piece of paper. But, I mean, just look at that. Just look how pretty. Just a, a random little valley here in the middle of nowhere. It's just like everywhere here is just the most beautiful thing you've ever seen there. Don's story is very complicated. Um, you know how, like, a lot of characters in a lot of these stories, they... There was some redeeming quality. You know, there's some redeeming good thing. Honestly, guys, we haven't really found any. Um, it seems like every time there was anything he was involved in, he was the bad guy. Um, I mean, I know it's Southern West Virginia, you know, corruption. You know, we're kind of known for that sort of thing, you know, and have been for a while. But, you know, when it gets to, you know, that sort of a level, I mean, he was in charge of everything, and he, he ruled with an iron fist. He was called a czar for a reason, you know, like Russia. Um, but, I mean, even ever, right down to hiring of teachers, you know, he, he approved that stuff. He, he was right there in the middle of it, and everything that, you know, every instance that we can come up with, you know, he was... He was the bad guy, you know. He was the one that was there to kill the good guy. And here we are. So I'm going to head on out here. Like I said, I've got three stops uh, to go take you guys to. We'd like to actually show you the places when we tell you the stories. You know, we don't just sit at home and, you know, show you stock video and tell you the stories. We actually take you to the places and show you the stories. But we're going to head on out here. Uh, we are in... Um, just crossed into Logan County, West Virginia, and we will be in the town of Logan here in a few minutes. Uh, and if you guys will remember, um, we did a couple stories down that down that way already. Uh, Mamie Thurman, uh, Ann Lawson, a couple others. But anyway, we're going to head on out and go find these places and go from there. See y'all in a second. And now this is the town of Logan. 
uh, we brought you guys here before uh, for a couple different a couple different times couple different stories over this way and I don't know if you noticed like the old architecture you can tell you know the old buildings and stuff and there's a lot of them here and as I head back out uh, I'll circle around kind of show you the town just a little bit but uh, right here is what I wanted to show you this is what I brought you here for right there on that corner Now that is the courthouse. That's Don's old office. His office was right there. Now there was a little bit of contention between Heather and I about whether or not this was the original building or not uh, because the sheriff's department was built in 1911 after it was burned in Stallings, West Virginia and was beyond repair. Don was sheriff from uh, 1912 to 1924 and then went to jail in 1925. And he was only 25 when he became sheriff. Now, anybody with any common sense, you know, no offense to 25-year-olds out there, 25 is not mature enough to be a sheriff. You, you, you and I know that. I mean, I think most 25-year-olds probably know that too. But like I said, the building itself, there was some contention between Heather and I about whether or not it was the original one, but apparently it is. And we're going to go over there here in a second, check out the historical marker right there, show you that. But the building, like I said, it's had some, some serious remodeling and some serious facelifts here. But there's the, the memorial for Princess Sarah Coma. And we've mentioned her before. We plan to do a story on her sooner or later. But in memory of Princess Sarah Coma, who with her tribe made the first settlement in this valley. Her death occurred about 1780. Directed by the Princess Ericoma Chapter National Society of the Daughters of the American Revolution, May 1936. But that's a really cool story too. Horrible tragedy. You know, the way Native Americans were treated in some cases, in most cases. But right here, on the burning of the Logan Courthouse, on January 12, 1862, Colonel Edward Sieber led the 37th Ohio in pursuit of the Black Striped Company, a Confederate guerrilla unit, on the 14th. Uh, skirmishing erupted at Logan. The rebels were driven back, but their hillside position and, and rising guy and dot forced the Union troops to withdraw from town and on January 15th, but not before Sieber had them burn the courthouse and other buildings but you know like i said there's a there's a lot of a lot of history surrounding this place this town and this very site right here um you know everything from just all sorts of stuff there's all sorts of historical events that actually took place here like i said we've actually this is our third time been to this building for for stories so you know, that, that should say something right there in, a, in and of itself. But the town, I don't know if y'all noticed how, how narrow, like I said, how narrow the streets are. Uh, there's a reason for that. These were set up for horse carriages. And in a lot of, you know, a lot of other places, their streets were set up for horse carriages as well. But in a lot of places, you know, the old buildings, they tend to get torn down and new ones put in their place. They move them back a little bit, you know, that sort of thing when they put the new one up and you have a little bit more room. But most of these buildings are original. So what do you do? Nothing. You just have narrow streets. That's all there is to it. There is no other option. But anyhow, like I said, this was, this was Don's office right here. Hard to imagine. It don't look that old, but the old building's underneath there somewhere. It's been remodeled, had a couple facelifts. The old building is in there somewhere. Wild, isn't it? It looks, I mean, it looks like it could have just been built a couple years ago. I mean, it looks modern. It looks very modern building. But it's not. Just the outside, just the facade is new. The rest is much older than it looks.
581 Main Street. This was Don Chafin's house. Big fancy two and a half story house on a humble civil servant's salary. Right. We read an article that uh, said that he had um, that he had like uh, the equivalent of about five million dollars in today's money. Uh, I don't remember exactly how much he had now at his death, um, but it equated to approximately, you know. So I mean, the guy was rolling in money. He had lots of money on a, you know, on a sheriff's salary. But uh, Don the Czar Chafin lived here in this house uh, from 1920, except for the time that he was in jail for, you know, for moonshining when he wasn't in jail. This was his house. Um, <laughs> He purchased the house in 1920. He actually bought it from his brother-in-law for $27,500. He bought this piece of land, which was many, many, many times, many times what his salary would have been. Uh, like I said, it's just new old buildings. That one's the Holland Apartments, 1926. Uh, all sorts of really old, old buildings here in town. But like I said, you can imagine at the time what this looked like. I mean, it's it's fallen into disrepair a couple times. Uh, the uh, was it the women's club, I believe it was. Yeah, the Logan's women's club, Logan women's club has been in there. But uh, like I said, the the place has fallen into disrepair a couple times. We found some old pictures where they were working on it and things like that, restoring the house, that kind of thing. But pretty piece of property, you know, has the rails all the way around it. Really pretty. I mean, back in the day, you know, you're one of the wealthiest people in town, you know, on a, like I said, on a sheriff's salary. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> but anyhow, I'm gonna, like I said, I'm gonna show you a little bit of the old town Hey, it's it's a really old town now that it is that it is real pretty place though I mean you know if you like old architecture I mean look at that how cool does that look looks like it's still in use no it's not I don't know maybe I'm not sure if it's still in use or not Don's old house Show you around the side here, real quick before we head out. Look at those windows, those gabled windows. It's a beautiful old house. Do you know what built that though? Blood money built that. It's wild, isn't it? The people that that died to. It's wild to think about, isn't it? Okay, now this, well, this is Lowe's. 
<laughs> Why are we at Lowe's? Does, does Leo need some plumbing part or some electrical part? Well, the short answer is no. We're not here for Lowe's or Walmart or any of the other mall. This is the Logan, uh, this is the Fountain Place Mall at Logan. Well, we're not here for the mall at all, actually. We are here for this little road right over there. The one between us and Arby's. This little road that goes right there. Where that red truck is right now. Now that is J.B. Ellis Road. J.B. Ellis Branch Road is the name of it. Uh, you see, Don, he actually, he murdered. But long before this was a mall, this was a murder site. I bet none of these people know that. But this was actually a murder site long before it was a mall. Don shot a 26-year-old kid named Frank Kazee. A young man shot him. And it was basically, it was one of West Virginia's very first road rage incidents. And, you know, I'll go find someplace else, someplace, someplace prettier to tell you the rest of the story. I just wanted to bring you, just thought I'd stop on the way. Uh, big coal mine operation. Thought I'd stop and show you guys what it was all about, what it was all fought about. It's all over coal, coal money and the power that comes from it. You can see it comes down the chutes up there, goes down into the piles, all that. Gets loaded onto trains here, trucks back there, all that sort of stuff. But I just thought since we was going right by here, I just stopped for a second and kind of show y'all the place. And you can see the coal pouring out up there. big operation here the mine office Don't care what a pile of coal a mountain of coal that's where it goes on the trains right there it's loaded on the trains okay now this right here I just thought I'd stop for a second it's another one of those stop for a second and show you something real quick uh i got lucky today I, I knew where all of today's sites were where i was going i got lucky no thorns no hills to climb all that good stuff so i had a little bit of extra time to play with thought i'd stop here and show you all this real quick you know how you buy spring water now this is just on the side of the road this is us 119 like i told you earlier quarter g it's the main road through here basically there's a lot of two lane here and there that kind of thing this is the main four lane road going through the area but this right here is just on the side of the road now this is a natural spring you know how you guys you go go out the store and buy spring water you don't have to do that here <laughs> there's springs all over the place here that and you can see it comes out of the ground right there this is a true mountain spring it comes out of the ground right there and this is some of the purest water you're ever going to run across since i'm here i'm just going to have to take a sip very clean very clear cool huh this runs right off the side of the mountain i see people stop here all the time cars and trucks you know with water bottles it's getting it i mean it's cold it's really cold coming out of the ground nice just thought i'd stop and show you all this just a, a natural spring it's just right by right beside the, the road i know where probably about six of these are just thought i'd show it to you what do you think it's a little bit prettier than your average lowe's parking lot isn't it <laughs> anyway i figured i'd come down here uh and tell you the rest of the story that like i said the lowe's parking lot's a little bit eh, you know what i mean but uh, there's corridor g bridge right there i mentioned earlier and you can see 
right there the highway comes down behind those trees crosses the river uh, you cross the river two or three times here you're going up quarter g you're in west virginia you're in kentucky you're in west virginia you're in kentucky it just keeps coming back across the line but uh, this is one of my little fishing spots here pretty isn't it how bad do you want to throw a hook in there admit it it's okay go ahead you want to don't you <laughs> i do too i don't blame you i was just telling heather on the phone i wish i'd brought my uh, fishing rod with me but anyhow uh our story don chafin now uh you see the story went to say uh well he, he like i told jet Lowe's, he murdered a young man named frank kazi a 26 year old um in a, in a vehicle the story went to say that uh, around midnight on a Saturday, two vehicles, which were referred to uh, by a local newspaper article as machines, were traveling up the creek in the vicinity of the home of J.B. Ellis. Now, that uh, J.B. Ellis Drive that I showed you, that's, you know, Lowe's. Apparently, J.B. Ellis lived there. Uh, there's a whole holler named after the guy. There's several things. We can't find anything on the guy. I mean, you would think that someone who has an entire holler named after them there would be something you know the closest we can find we found a i think it was a john h ellis cemetery but we couldn't corroborate it with uh this rrjh ellis because we didn't have his birth and death dates so we couldn't verify or you know we couldn't verify that that was him or not so you know we just kind of left that at that i just thought it was strange that you know someone who has an entire holler and several other things named after them you would think you would find some information you know about this person but uh, anyhow uh, they were in the vicinity of jb ellis's homes or home when the machine carrying chafin and three of his friends passed the machine in which abe kirk cage kirk frank kazee were riding kazee was in the back seat Although it's not been reported, it's believed that words were exchanged in literally, like I said, what could be the very first road rage incident in West Virginia. The report said that, uh, that Chafin's machine stopped about 20 yards from the place where the other vehicle had chosen to turn around. Chafin approached the vehicle and demanded to know who the passengers were. Abe Kirk is said to have answered, you know us, Don. Uh, uh, to this, Frank Kazee is also said to have said, Sure, Don, you know us. Chafin backed up a few yards and then approached the vehicle again. Chafin reportedly opened the side door and is said to have fired the shot which killed Kazee. He just literally walked up to the car, opened the door, and shot the young man. Just as simple as that. No questions, no, no nothing. He just walked up and shot the guy. Anyhow, Chafin reportedly uh, backed up a few yards, like I said, approached the vehicle. He opened the side door and fired the shot. Chafin returned to his machine and drove back to town. The two Kirks also started for town and rode, uh, rode for some time before they looked back to speak to Kazee. When they turned around to talk to him, he didn't answer. He was dead. The story said that the Kirks thought that Chafin had fired the pistol just to have fun. He did it just out of meanness, according to them. You know, they were the ones there. But anyway, following, uh, he posted a $5,000 bond the next day. Uh, Don was said to have been visibly affected by the tragedy. He said that he had no recollection of the previous night's events at all because he had been drinking. He said that he had no memory of the shooting, the boy, or any of it. He said his exact words were that uh, such a thing was entirely out of his mind. Chafin saw the boy's father later and reportedly tried to comfort him as best as he could to try and apologize and all this sort of thing, you know. Uh, he ordered the undertaker to spare no expense in giving the youth a burial. I never felt so bad in my life, Chafin said to a reporter. 
The Kazee boy was a good friend of mine, and I can't remember shooting him at all. I would not think of doing such a thing. I cannot be, conv be convinced yet that I killed him. When the officers came for me and told me that I had shot him, I could not believe them. It seemed so foolish to think that I would do anything like that. The whole events of Saturday night are an absolute blank to me. I have no recollection of anything that took place that night. Chafin's words, I mean, literally spoken like a true politician, uh, that still, that set the, set the stage for his trial that came about uh, three months later in October. The headline for October 18th read, Don, quit, Don Chafin is acquitted of murder charges by a jury. The story said that the jury had been out for nearly four hours before reaching its decision. He had gotten away with murder because of his ties to powerful people. And feeling remorseful didn't bring Frank back, unfortunately. We can't find Frank anywhere as far as his, where he's buried and very little, on, very little information on him on Ancestry and my heritage and all the other sites. It's actually kind of strange. You would think his drinking, as a matter of fact, his drinking would come into play later in his life when he reportedly got drunk and entered a UMWA uh, meeting and started making threats. And it was there that he was shot in the chest by a union fish official who, you know, really literally hated the man anyway. How does someone just short of evil, get a whole bunch of people to follow them. Are they evil too? You know, are they, is that the case? I mean, I, I know people do a lot of, a lot of things for money, you know, and was that the case? You know, that they're willing to do all of this stuff and murder these people and just be horrible, horrible humans, you know, for money. Was, was that the only Catalyst. Coming down, yeah. It comes down to a matter of what you choose to do, what you choose to be. You know, Don chose to be the person that he was. We just put it that way. You know, and we all make our choices. We all, every day, make the same choices. You know, your your life is your your life is nothing but a series of choices. Make the right ones. It's a good lesson, isn't it? Be a good person. Death came to a colorful and dynamic former sheriff of Logan County following surgery performed several days ago. Physicians believed Sunday night that he had been making a satisfactory recovery, but then he took a turn for the worse at 5 a.m. yesterday and died an hour and 15 minutes later. Don was believed to be one of Huntington's wealthiest men. Don had an extensive real estate holdings in Logan and Huntington, including the Guarantee Building here, if that's how you say that. And he also headed the Chafin Coal Company and the Chafin Land Company. So he lived in the Guarantee Building penthouse at the end of his life. But he had suffered two severe heart attacks in recent years, and friends and relatives were anxious that he was going to overdo it and his temperament was not such that he could heed the warnings. So they put in a chair type elevator that was installed to carry him from the last floor on the bank building to the main floor in his penthouse. This was perhaps one of the few concessions he made to the state of his health. But at the end of the day, Don Chafin faced what we all will face one day and that is death. No amount of money nothing can save you from this all you can do is hope that you lived a life where people like me talk to, about you in a good light and that your family and friends remember you the way you want to be remembered because your memory is really all you have and some people don't even have that but Don Chafin definitely will be remembered and he's remembered right now by this video that where I am you may also be. I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
if you love me keep my commandments and I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever I will not leave you comfortless I will come to you because I live you shall also live peace I leave with you my peace I give unto you let not your heart be troubled neither, neither let it be afraid it's beautiful beautiful our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us by day our daily bread forgive us our trespassers as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory amen So we are looking for Mr. Don Chafin's grave. And I will not leave here till I find it. We've been round and round, up and down. It is a brown marker with what looks like a, a microphone on it. It's not a microphone, it's just shaped like one like a, a golf tee with a golf ball on it, white. So the birds have come out, so I guess that means the rain's done. darker so I thought he was buried oh the family of Don Chafin his wife is here too somewhere infamous Don Chafin. So he died after having surgery. He died a few days later. And he's buried next to his wife, Mary, who looks like she died about 17 years later in 1970. Their children, Lily, Mary, James, John. Now I don't know. This isn't. This is John B. Chafin, 1879 to 1890. So this is where Don's story ended, and it's also where our story ends, as far as the video goes. <laughs> Either way, thank you for watching, and until next time. Bill Billy's out. Bill Billy's out. Bill Billy's out. <laughs> See you guys next time. Thanks for watching. Bye bye. Okay.